Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar here in May on our continuing series of content for publishing media companies, associations, and event organizers. My name is Brett Kierstead. I'm Senior Vice President of Sales and Operations for Knowledge Marketing. And this month, we've hit on a very popular topic, apparently, according to registration counts, uh, focused on email deliverability, affectionately titled, 10 Ways to Suck at Email Deliverability. So we're glad to have you guys here for about 45 minutes or so, um, talking through this really interesting subject, which I think a lot of times uh, is, is the boogeyman of subjects about how email works and what goes on behind the scenes. Um, and so my goal today is to give you guys some, some uh, ideas and perspective on it, and uh, hopefully you guys can walk away with some, some ideas on how to improve your performance in this area. I do record these sessions, um, so those of you who uh, have other people often forward them along. We will provide uh, a link to the content as well as the recording afterwards. If you have questions along the way, please submit them through the GoToWebinar uh, dialog box, and we'll do our best to try and get to them uh, in the time that we have. Um, in addition, uh, we'll have a poll here in a minute, so hopefully you can participate in that as well. For a little bit, those of you who are new, this is month 41 in a row of webinars for the industry, but those of you who are brand new, we welcome you guys to this education series. Knowledge Marketing provides technology and business services to publishers, media companies, associations, and event organizers focused in five major areas, unified audience database, email, which is obviously the big focus of today, traditional circulation management, behavioral capture and reporting, and we have a really big strong emphasis on media sales and marketing strategy. So uh, we really have a lot of experience in this area. We have a lot of really good customers. Uh, that are very thoughtful about how they go about this. And I think, as many of you will see by the end of the day, this is as much a, um, a uh, strategic exercise as it is a technology one. So uh, hopefully you guys can uh, to walk away with some good ideas. Again, a little bit about knowledge marketing, just so you understand where we're coming from. We do send out, we are a full service email service provider. Again, focused on the vertical industry that we're in. We're growing incredibly quickly. We send over 120 plus million emails a month on behalf of our clients focused in publishing. That's a well, well over a billion. We'll probably do you know, two billion, uh, 2 billion email run rate by the end of this year. Uh, we get very high deliverability. We have good performance from open rates and you kind of see from a sender score perspective, which we'll talk more about, uh, is a big part of this discussion. So this is an area where we spend a significant amount of time, energy, and resources and have a lot of experience and hopefully I can kind of share that with you today. So let's take a quick poll. I'm going to send this, select this poll to, to launch, and uh, hopefully you guys can ask it. But here's the net of it. When you think about your current state of email, you look at your own organization, you were to self-assess, there's three choices here. Either A, we're doing good, you know, we actively monitor our deliverability, either through yourselves or through a partner, and trend-wise you're doing great. Two, you do still, you understand what's going on here, you actively monitor it, but um, you're seeing declining issues, or three, you, you know, you really don't know. And I don't mean that as an insult, I just mean that it's not something you monitor, you're not real sure about it, you really couldn't tell at this point in time where you stack up in the grand scheme of things. So take a minute if you don't mind, pick A, B, or C, and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, about 10 more seconds. Almost all of you have answered. All right, that looks pretty good. So I'm not great at polls, so I'm just going to close it, and I can tell you the results if it doesn't work. Um, and that is, is that the polls came out as, as number one was 50%. So half the people are doing well, which is great, kind of coming to this webinar from a position of strength, I'll call it. The middle is 34%, so a third of you are here from what I'll just call a position of concern, and 16% of you are here from a position of uh, not knowing, uh, uh, not knowing where things stand. So hopefully this can get you guys started on this as well. Okay, so back to the, the discussion. Let, when we talk about email in this context, we are, as an industry are unique. Because a lot of times outside of publishing media association type organizations, email primarily is a marketing function 
or a commerce function, et cetera. But we have a very diverse set of needs for the tool called email. We deliver editorial content through newsletters. We do audit, audience development. We might do renewal activity you know, for subscriptions. We do event marketing. We might do general promotion to our customers for our own content. We might use third-party lists and incorporate them into our sends. We do lead gen programs using outside content. So we have a very um, sophisticated requirement when it comes to email. And a lot of people don't think of it, or they tend to gloss it over when you evaluate email providers or different systems or different techniques. And you don't think through the diversity of what this offers. So it does give us a unique challenge around how we structure email and deal with deliverability. So let's talk a little bit about deliverability. So deliverability is a complex term, but we'll keep it simple for today. And imagine it really focuses on the mechanism at which email gets from you to the, the end uh, recipient. You know, and, and inbox is the desired state. But obviously, in today's day and age, there's a lot of different rules around that. People can move yours. Uh, you know, in Gmail, there's different structures and lots of different rules. But we won't get into too much complexity on that, other than to say our goal is to get it from, you know, from us to them. And there's a lot of terminology that we'll introduce today that I encourage you to make sure you're familiar with if you're going to talk about this subject. Because again, most industries have have a language. Um, you know, there's a there's a particular language of how things communicate. So there is reputation, sender score, words like spam blacklist, whitelist, IPs, honeypot. These are some of the terms that um, are going to be introduced to today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, as we go forward here. OK, so when we think about it, so let me just kind of keep moving along here. The sequence that we talk about on deliverability, and we'll be quick, and then we'll get into the 10 reasons, is if you think about what you're doing, you're sending out an email for a particular purpose through your IP, through, through your internet protocol, through a sending location. And there's protections that are out there, either through third parties, through ISPs, through, through the actual companies themselves, through firewalls, through technology, through rating agencies, et cetera, that protect the receiver from emails that they don't want. The receiver then has an environment where they receive it into, and then depending on what they do with it, there's activity, opens and clicks. So really, we're mainly focused today on how these all interrelate, how you, know, you want to make sure that the, the strategy that you have gets you past that level of protection into the best receiver environment possible, and then ultimately to promote email engagement through opens and clicks and response. So this, the sequence you have to think about it as a business process and what you do along the way will, will make decisions on whether or not you're successful or not. From a measurement standpoint, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And, and, and I'll just kind of keep it real simple here. Like basic measurement would just say your email got through. It got through that process into the, the customer's environment. Um, inbox delivery is a little bit more complex. There's technologies out there like Return Path and others that do. It's a pretty expensive technology that do real sophisticated inbox monitoring. So the difference of it got through, it passed through the filter and was delivered versus more sophisticated inbox delivery is another mechanism. From an engagement perspective, there's kind of soft engagement. I think we know that opens themselves are a, a lighter measurement of engagement. And certainly, because sometimes you get false opens, sometimes there's various different mechanisms that that happens. But usually, hard levels of engagement are clicks. It tells you very specifically that someone engaged with content. And each of these mechanisms kind of give you a barometer of whether you're doing a good job or not. The picture below at the bottom is from Return Path. Again, they, they, they have a very high level of authority on industry-wise what's going on. And, and, and either surprisingly or not surprisingly, from a trends perspective, deliverability is declining. In other words, uh, you know, what used to be a high rate is getting lower and lower. And some of the reasons for that are, number one, there's more and more tools set up to prevent emails from happening and there's from getting through. So there's more tools. And I would argue that on our side of things, we're not taking enough time and discipline to figure out the appropriate ways to get through them. We're, we're probably stuck in a lot of our ways and our methodologies on how we send email. And so while we haven't morphed the way we send content, 
the, the tools to protect themselves have gotten more sophisticated. So, I mean, I think that natural trend is what's happening because um, if you're blocking more and, and, and uh, not improving the way you send, you're going to have this result. So what we want to do is to kind of give you guys some definitions here. <laughs> the title of this webinar is How Not to Suck at Deliverability. So we have to define a factor of what that means. So let's just say that if you are somebody, you know, return path number said 76%. So if, if you're below 76% on your score and or you're trending down, how about we just say you are not good? <laughs> Or you suck. How about that? So, or we suck at it if we're not doing better than that. But I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant about it. But <clears throat> there has to be a mechanism for what distinguishes between improvement and success versus failure. So, when you get to the end of this and you go through a tool, you can use some of the publicly available tools to test your sending score. Um, you can barometer yourself against this on how well you're doing. Okay. So, with that in mind, how do we define? Um, ways to surefire um, fail at deliverability and because you know we tend to want to try and be positive we'll try and give you the flip side to what that means okay so again um, if those of you who are on the call when I think about the audience for this if you are the, the the guy that has 20 years of deliverability email experience and you've got a you sit behind the the desk with the most sophisticated tools in the industry some of this stuff in here might be a little bit basic for you um, I really want to make sure it's something that has universal understanding that people who want to learn more about this and improve uh, can find some nuggets. But if you are uh, you know, the world's greatest email deliverability expert, you'll probably find some of this content to be a little bit um, uh, rudimentary, if you will. So without that, let's get going. So number one, you're surely going to fail at deliverability if you only believe your reputation mattered in high school. Okay, so uh, the, of course, reputation matters all the time. You know, reputation represents most commonly what is called through or uh, visualized through what's called a sender score. So a sender score is a, is a metric that measures the quality of the sending IP. Generally speaking out there, it's, there's a zero to one scale, and if you look at the average, again, it's around 80, 76, et cetera. And if you look at most reasons why deliverability fails, it points back to the lowness of the score. So what happens is, is incoming firewalls or incoming ISP or ISPs or the different tools that are out there set up an assessment mechanism and they look at the sending score of the sending IP and say, okay, you know, if it has an extremely low sending score, that already sets off a red flag and now I might look at other metrics around that email, keywords and other things to determine whether or not I want to let it through. Um, the calculation of it is on a rolling 30-day average versus other senders. So, you know, you are getting compared against the general world, whether this is through ISPs or through um, Return Path or other places that do this monitoring, to determine how well you're doing. Um, it also has a subjective component to it. How many complaints are out there? What does your volume activity look like? How many rejections are you getting? What is the acceptance rate like opens click? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. And it is a, an algorithm that you can stick your nose in and get involved with. Um, different sites are out there. If you type, what's my sending score or how do I evaluate my sending score, there's a lot of different places and tools you can do it. And senderscore.org, for example, is part of Return Path. They've got a nice tool there. And you can improve this through careful monitoring. So when you, when you ask yourself, you know, reputation management is not just something for a personal issue. It's also an issue around how you deal with the performance of whether your emails get through. So check out tools out there that can help you evaluate that. A good visual on this, a real simple one that I stole from uh, online, was just these different mechanisms make up the component of what is your sender score. And then ultimately that sender score is used as a filtering mechanism to whether you have high deliverability or not. Okay, so that's one. So again, reputation is more than just what happened in high school. Number two, here's another reason why you can surely be terrible at deliverability, and that is if you're still doing batch and blast. You know, I, I, as I've been in this industry now for four plus years, the anxiety that people have in, in a publishing organization about their current state of email batch and blast is, is palpable. Um, you would think that in today's day and age, 
um, there would be more of an awareness from an executive perspective to a salesperson's perspective to audience development to the marketing people about being cautious about just blasting out email. But it seems like no matter how many times this conversation comes up, there's a large swath of people that just don't seem to get it. Um, it really has to be a top-down philosophy. You know, this, this mantra of selling the biggest number possible leads to a significant amount of email being sent that has no real purpose. Um, all the metrics are eroding around it, opens, clicks, all of these things erode when you take this batch and blast mentality. And it really represents a, lot, a lack of a thoughtful strategy. I think a lot of you who are on the phone, a lot of you that I talk to, lament what goes on philosophically on batch and blast, and but people don't necessarily understand it, what that means, or maybe they don't care, um, but the impact on it is something as um, critical behind the scenes as um, uh, deliverability. I'll always hear how many times I hear that we just need to get it out the door, you know, and they don't spend the time and blast out this advertiser program or blast out this internal issue without any thought on it. A couple things that people are trying to do around that, if you can't get around it, at least think about the impact on an individual. Okay, so if, if you have a batch and blast mentality as a business, at least take a step back and ask yourself, how can I improve the performance of to an individual? Because one component of your deliverability has to do with complaints. So if I get blasted once a day, right, as an individual, that's better than if I get blasted five times a day. So if your company strategy is perverted, at least you should try and put in tools and processes to prevent me as an individual subscriber from, from getting too much bass and blast email in a day which in turn will cause me to do less complaining. So again, even if you can't change your culture, at least change from a technology standpoint the metering and threshold and prioritization of emails that might go to an individual. Because again, um, arguments or opt-outs or um, disputes with organizations is part of what can deteriorate the performance of your score, and those usually come from individuals. Okay, number three, spam. Right, spam is a common word. You know, if you only think spam is ham, then you don't understand deliverability. But we're not Hawaii. Hawaii has loves spam, but the rest of us don't. Okay, so just as a reminder of what spam means, okay, and why it's important to you. Spam is this started in this 2003 with this um, analogy, this can spam, controlling the assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing act of 2003. So if you never knew where that came from, that's where it started. And it was designed for just what it says. It was really designed to slow down what was happening when it came to unsolicited email. Um, and while it started in something as uh, nefarious as pornography, it obviously p spills over into all aspects of how deliverability happens. So it had grown from there. And Canada adopted CASEL, which uh, you know is a similar um, uh, ruling, if you will, or set of framework for how unsolicited content is delivered. And now Europe has GDPR, which again is general data protection regulations, all around this same issue. So the rules are getting more strict. And generally, a good way to think of it is the more anonymous, the more mass mail, the more unsolicited you are the more likely you are to fall into the category of spam. So when you assess yourself what you're doing with a particular send, you should always ask yourself, if, I, if the recipient might consider me anonymous, mass mailed, or an unsolicited, this is the bucket you're falling into. You know, again, sometimes we'll talk a little bit later about words that can signal that. But from this perspective, right now, think of it as a philosophy. If you're violating these kinds of things, you're likely falling into that spam world. You're likely going to get reported as spam. You're going to go in the spam bucket, and you're going to end up hurting future deliverability. So again, I think we all know spam isn't just ham. Um, it isn't even ham in the first place. But from this particular case, you should be educated on what really it means. Okay, number four, you're also going to be bad at deliverability if you think Blacklist is only the show on TV, okay, so, which of course it's not, but let me just tell you a little bit more about what Blacklist means, because a lot of times people say, oh, we got Blacklisted, or we're Blacklisted, so understand what's actually going on, okay? Being on a Blacklist 
just alone does not 100% predicate you from not getting through. However, it makes it unbelievably difficult to. What it is is that there's tools out there that have real-time databases that sit out there that help evaluate incoming email for an ISP or for, um, you know, for an actual uh, uh, organization that's a recipient of an email. So think of it as almost like a, a uh, somebody at the door, you know, almost a bouncer at the door who's evaluating who's on the list and who's not on the list. Again, they can kind of make a decision. They'll, they'll say, look, we don't recommend taking this guy, but the ISP has the ultimate decision of whether to let your email go through. So these services, this kind of front layer, Spam House, Barracuda, Spam Cop, and Valument, these are the types of tools and, and service providers out there that are helping protect um, the ISPs and then ultimately the end recipient from people that um, are, are uh, abusing the system. And so the alternative to blacklist is whitelist, which puts you on kind of the safe list. Again, think about you're walking into a bar, oh, you're on the list, you're good, go ahead. You know, So whitelist is a status that you can achieve in some cases through you know, brute force, through making phone calls, to explaining your case, to talking to people about um, uh, why you should be included, to explaining the nature of it, and sometimes that might be a call into a particular company, um, sometimes it might be called to one of these organizations, etc. But you really have to spend a little bit of time, if you feel like you're on a blacklist, getting yourself removed because, again, think of them as somebody, the bouncer at the bar that's not even letting you get in the door. Okay, so blacklist is something that is uh, has a specific term, but remember, it's not, it, it, it's almost a guarantee that if you're on a blacklist for a particular um, ISP or for a particular uh, corporate sender that you're looking to send to, especially in B2B, um, you've got to actually take a proactive step to get yourself off that list. And a lot of places just do it automatically, and, and you, can, you can argue your way, if you will, or make your case to get off it. Sometimes we have customers, when they start new with us, um, you know, they've been sending to a corporate IP or a corporate address and it's not recognized and we may have to intervene on their half and call the administrator and say, hey, you know, this sending domain is editorial content, we're just a new provider of that service, please remove us from the blacklist. And a lot of times those organizations are willing to do so. So it's not a death sentence, but you definitely have to take some time and get involved. Okay, next one is dedicated IPs. Who needs them? Okay, this is an interesting conversation. A lot of you may or may not have thought about this or you may not even know what's going on behind the scenes if you're using a third-party service provider, but let me educate you a little bit on what this means. An IP represents the original place from the internet or through where your emails are being sent from. There's two different oversimplifications of ways to do it. There's what's called common pool or there's dedicated IP. Common pool would be one of those scenarios where there's, let's just take in the publishing world, let's say you go with you know, kind of a bulk email provider like a constant contact or something like that. What they do is they take a whole bunch of different sending domains or senders you know, and then they pull them all into one IP and then they send from that IP. So that way, you know, in some cases that can be good because if you have a lot of good things and maybe you're a little shaky, <laughs> you can ride on the coattails, almost like insurance, you can ride on the coattails of the good guys. Um, however, Generally speaking, the danger with that is if you're mixing together quality and less quality, you could be in danger. Um, a good example, a simple illustration is to say the difference between, you think about your own editorial newsletters, you know, where many of you have a lot of rigor in terms of how you manage that newsletter subscriber list versus a third party list that you may rent or you may uh, get from an advertiser to send along with a campaign. The problem with Common Pool IP is if you're all sending it from the same place and you do damage to that sending IP because you had a crappy list, now all of a sudden you're putting at risk getting your normal editorial through, if that makes sense. So what a lot of customers want to do and a lot of people think about is, and we try to do with our customers, is to segment out where appropriate unique IP sending so that if there's a degradation in any part of your email, delivery, maybe you, you rented a list for a, for a marketing campaign or, or a renewal efforts or telemarketing efforts that you started with the email list and maybe you were following up with another renewal campaign or an advertiser gave you their customer list and said, hey, can you throw these names into my database? Or they want you to send their content, which stinks, 
you know, if you mix that in and that send with editorial, now you're at risk of, oh crap, now my newsletters aren't going through, the real money makers. So, so unique IP is a strategy when you know that you might be caught with this idea of mixing quality and non-quality lists and content into one place, it's probably a good idea to think about breaking these out in a logical manner um, so that you make sure at worst you have, yes, you may have a very low sender score for, for third party, but, um, but at least it's not uh, deteriorating your core product. So uh, there's not one guaranteed way to do this because there's pros and cons to both, but it is something that a lot of people need to think about um, when they consider how they structure things. Okay, number six, a honeypot. Honeypot is golden and made from bees. Those of you who understand what a honeypot is, no, this is not golden, <laughs> okay? Um, so a honeypot means, and honeypot emails are specific emails that are used to trap spammers. So, you know, it, or, or another way to look at that is not just spammers in the sense of, but even just inappropriate or improper use of lists. So if you're granted, let's say you rent a list and you're granted a one-time use or in return, you turn around and you allow a one-time list rental of your emails, these, the, uh, the honeypot names are, are fake names, if you will, that are in there for the, their valid email addresses but fake names designed to capture people's behavior that's inappropriate, meaning they're, they're emailing when they shouldn't, they're sending content that's not appropriate, they've outlived, you know, they had a one-year license to use a name and a time has passed and they're using it. So basically, honeypots recommend, are, are tech tools and tricks to kind of catch people from doing things that are improper. Again, what that does is that allows or makes a case for somebody to either report you, right, which again would, could put you on a blacklist, could give you a low sender score, um, or even potentially ban you or block you even from their own um, email delivery. So you gotta be really careful, a honeypot, that's what the term means. You should be using them for sure, if you're ever using your list or anyone ever has any access to your list in a particular manner, if you're doing list rental or any mechanism where somebody might get their hands on your list in some form or fashion for one-time use, you better make sure that you've got you know, your own honeypot email addresses in there so that you can catch people that might be misusing the list. But again, if you yourself are an offender in this area and you're just sending out emails without any discretion, very likely there can be these spam traps in there that will um, lead downstream to poor deliverability. Okay, the more the merrier. You know, let's just keep emailing people, man. Uh, it's just awesome. Just pick a list and send them. And, you know, I think the general theme, again, you want to improve deliverability. And deliverability comes from the recipient having a positive response to your email. Because one, the system is, the, the technology side of things is okay. It, upset, it, it accepts your email. It's a valid email address with valid content. No one reports it as bad. You know, they're, they're positive about what they receive. And this trend that's going on around targeting helps improve engagement, which also helps your score. You know, so we talked a little bit about some of those metrics. So, you know, targeting, whether that's targeting through more specific attributes of an individual, making sure that they're getting content that they've opted in for, things that they've configured, you know, you want to be targeting leads to a more likelihood that the recipient will have a positive response as well as that the email address itself is valid. You know, because when you target down to appropriate names, you generally tend to weed out some of those characteristics of what might be in honeypot emails, and you get down to names that are much, much more appropriate. So again, targeting is a way, instead of just blast, batch and blast, as we said, or even just picking large lists without any um, uh, binding attributes to make sure that you improve that performance, <clears throat> okay? So again, and, and, and some people might say, you know, hey, we did a query, we looked at a list of names, and there were 60,000 names or 59,000, but you know what, we know that if we send to that, our deliverability, they're not all really that interested, they just met some criteria, and so we might hone in on a very engaged group that's much more targeted, maybe the overlapping between multiple filters, that highly engaged group is very likely to uh, be a more positive recipient, a more valid email address, a more positive recipient of the email, again, which will contribute to better engagement and a higher score. So again, engagement, these are some of the tools that are happening out there that can lead to higher degrees of deliverability. Okay, the next one is kind of an obvious one. A lot of people think about this, but I think people get lazy, is that free is your favorite word. If you think free is a good email to help with deliverability, um, you know, this is an ever-evolving thing, words that used to be common 
Um, but you can go out on any Google search and just type, you know, you know, the most common words that equate to spam, you know. And the list is very, very long. There's primary words and secondary words, so I just pulled an excerpt starting from A. But like these are the kinds of things that if they show up in your subject lines, if they show up in your um, early parts of your content, are going to lead to a lot of these filter tools to think that this is spam. And again, some of them are very obvious, you know, but a lot of them might creep in when you think about them in context, um, why someone might think that this is not a logical way to send valid email. Uh, because again, if we go back to what we said before, if I'm doing mass market email and I want to use kind of the overarching buzzwords, um, that's a surefire, kind of the most obvious way to, to lower de deliverability and signal that what you're sending is inappropriate, but sometimes it can sneak up on you when you're not thinking about it, when you realize that some of these words used in a different context could be very appropriate. Um, so anyway, there, there's lots of different sites to look it up. Just type it in Google and it'll come up with many, many different people's opinions about what are words that are currently um, causing lower rates of deliverability. Okay, next up is Outlook. You know, you know, a surefire way to get crappy deliverability of any campaign is to send it through Outlook. And I, I don't mean to pick on them because we use them as a business tool, but I think what people tend to think about is they think that great email and great deliverability is a, is a UI. It's a, it's, it's a front-end process. Um, you know, Outlook is a good email tool, but it wasn't architecturally designed and even on the back end of a lot of corporations to handle that back office rigor that you need. So also emerging right now are many traditional, what I would call, they were not email focused tools, but they're using them. Like, you know, we at Knowledge Marketing use Salesforce, okay? Salesforce was a CRM, right? And for many, many years you used it as CRM, and now they're starting to try and, through their uh, acquisition of exact target, trying to do email. And, and it's fine to use something that has a, a really strong email deliverability component to it, like exact target, but, by nature, all tools that allow you to send bulk email, even if it's easy to do, don't necessarily have the rigor on the back end. You know, everybody's all uh, a gaga about HubSpot, and I love a lot of their technologies, but we've had a couple customers run tests and see very sketchy deliverability because it's just not really what the tool is designed for. It's a slick, very successful marketing automation tool, but the discipline behind the scenes to make sure that those great marketing automation messages get through isn't always there. So and they'll get better, and of course they will, but it's just something you guys need to continue to assess. So again, it's not the UI that determines deliverability. It's the rigor on the back office and the analysis and attention paid to some of the things that we've been discussing. And again, lastly, don't forget there's also a separate level of deliverability tools versus deliverability service. Even if you're using your own in-house email system or you're using a tool, somebody behind the scenes is taking a human look at it. Um, because there's always some percentage of things that you know is not spam, but a tool might think of it as spam, and somebody needs to make a phone call or an interaction or a communication to explain either to an IP or to a receiving company why that isn't spam. I could just explain it. Yes, the word, you know, Viagra is in the email, but if I'm Pfizer, that's a necessary component of my product. So I need to explain to people why even though certain high keywords are in there, I'm a valid sender. So the tools might, might block certain things, but you got to remember that there's a service and human component that can help clean it up uh, where necessary. Lastly, um, you know, there is a trend, as many of you probably know, in one-to-one -one communication. You know, people still want to feel special. I mean, even though email is a very bulk-oriented, low-cost tool, the recipient is still personal to them. So one of the things that you're seeing right now is, and a lot of you guys experience this on the subscription side, right? So not just print subscription, but your newsletter configurations, et cetera, is this rise of subscription management, meaning I as an individual manage my subscriptions, whether it's to newsletters, et cetera, and I'm tailoring and tweaking the type of content and the frequency at which I receive it. The more you allow for that individualized control over content, meaning what I receive and when I receive it, the more likely you are to have a positive individual experience and therefore less complaints, less escalations, et cetera. Uh, anybody involved in email knows you get these emails that say, for the love of God, take me off this list, right? And part of it is because, number one, either your tools don't support it right, or number two, your practices are bad. 
you know, or number three, you're just not listening to the specifics of the content that they want. So, you know, this individual relationship management, even though you're not sending, you know, 60,000 versions of, of the same email content, but what you are allowing is some level of configuration about people's frequency, et cetera. So I think the main thing you guys want to think about when it comes to personalization, again, is if you think about the recipient and ask yourself, of all the people bound to receive this, what would make them complain? And if you can identify what those complaints are along a lot of the things that we've discussed, you're on your way to better deliverability. Okay, so again, key points here before we wrap up. Deliverability is complex, and it's an act, I call it an active participation sport. Right? It's constantly changing. Any of you know Google, they change the algorithms that they have on what goes into Gmail. They set up those new tabs, and now what can go into each, and how I can configure things. So the control over what goes on on my inbox side is growing. As I started with, deliverability is going down as a trend because I think that the tools to block bad behavior is increasing at a pace faster than people are improving their behavior, if that makes sense. So, you know, the good news is, is that you have ability to really control this, but you have to be active with it. And again, I, I know a lot of you cringe and say, uh, the number one objection I hear is, yeah, well, I would if my sales guy on the last day didn't go out and sell 50,000 freaking email send, and now I got to go send it. I get that. I mean, I obviously get that you can do all the things you want and they sold a big lead deal to a third party that you know has a crappy list and bad content. You know, unfortunately, that's going to undermine things. So you just have to, like you say, pop down an email strategy, constant education on this issue. And, and again, the measurement of those specific results. Um, I think when you, um, when you communicate out the results of a third party lead program and you com communicate back to your salesperson, check the deliverability. Don't just let them know opens and clicks and leads. Let them know, here was the deliverability, here was the performance of it, here were some of the metrics on it, so they recognize the um, damage, if you will, to your reputation, both in terms of performance as well as um, you know, overall deliverability that these types of behaviors are. So um, the, the summary of all this, so again, hopefully you guys will take these away. We have an infographic that uh, will accompany this or you guys can download that will give you some of the visuals of these and uh, hopefully they can add to you some um, specific ideas on what that will um, keep in mind, you know, kind of keep it fresh, fresh and front and center. And for those of you that are out and about, we'll see you guys out on the next, uh, you know, couple of different events coming up here as well. Um, I'll just take a couple of quick questions in the extra minutes that we have. They're on here. Um, the warm-up procedures, a couple of questions were asked about IP warming. If you are going to switch, um, especially if you're high volume, and we do this with our clients, is we always set out to meter and do things in blocks. And there's a couple different things that do that. So let's say someone sends a million emails a month, you know, or two million emails a month. And they want to break those down into individual sends. So what we try to do is you always want to start sending out from an IP address with your most reliable content to your cleanest list. So getting off to a good start and sending out small batches of quality, uh, quality content to a strong list is critically important whenever you're starting on a new IP. Um, even if that just means you're kind of t toggling between a couple and old system and a new, you always want to make sure you have that kind of IP warming period. And again, the, obviously, it's, it's fairly intuitive to say use a good list and use a good content. And a lot of you guys have that, especially in your editorial. So first thing I would never do <laughs> is never send your first blast out of a new IP to be solely a third-party send of a rented list, you know, or an advertiser's customer list. Um, as far as um, how to tell, if, excuse me, how to tell if you're on a blacklist was a question. I mean, a lot of those tools just go out there. I mean, even if you type in Google, they, it'll show you a lot of the organizations that that are the monitors of that. Um, sometimes what we do is go in and look at individual sends. Like, let's say you run a uh, um, an email out, not an editorial, but maybe a lead lead editorial. Go in and look on your reports to see if there's any pattern of um, blocking. So let's say that you happen to notice that, uh, let's say you're sending emails to DuPont, you know, and you notice that there's a whole block of, you know, DuPont, you know, at DuPont.com that came back as blocked. Well, then you probably know that somewhere in that sequence you've been blacklisted or, you know, blocked from that, that domain, from that provider. 
So what typically people will do is they'll call up the email administrator of that company and they'll just say, hey, you know, we, we're sending out campaigns, we have people that opt in, etc. Could you please whitelist us? So sometimes it comes from public sources that you can find online. Sometimes it just comes from brute force to kind of go in and, and analyze the um, uh, analyze the particular information that that you see within a particular campaign. So uh, anyway, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up there. I'll answer the other questions that came. I really appreciate that. Again, thank you guys so much for attending. We'll be back again next month. You'll get a copy in, uh, of the. Uh, presentation if you like, as well as the opportunity to re-listen to the recording. So have a great day. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully everybody's getting out of here early, and uh, we'll see you guys all again next month. Take care. Bye now.